Good morning, everyone. The legislative hearing by the Subcommittee on Insular Affairs, Oceans, and Wildlife will now come to order. The Subcommittee meets today to hear testimony concerning two bills. H.R. 4339, a bill to encourage students from the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands to become civically engaged through local and federal government fellowships and H.R. 6015, a bill to require the Director of the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the Department of Commerce to publish certain economic data regarding territories and freely associated states and for other purposes. While Committee Rule 4G limits opening statements to the chair and the ranking minority member, in a few minutes and as a customary courtesy, I intend to also recognize our colleague the gentleman from the Northern Marianas Islands, Congressman Sablon, for any brief introductory remarks he may wish to make regarding the bill he has sponsored, H.R. 4339, and the witnesses from the CNMI that have joined us for today's hearing. If any other members have statements, they can be included in the hearing record under unanimous consent. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Our hearing today affords the subcommittee an opportunity to examine closely two bills that share in part an underlying objective of engendering a more responsive and assistive federal government for fulfilling important needs in our territories. The first bill on our agenda is H.R. 4339, introduced by Congressman Sablon. H.R. 4339 is aimed at expanding opportunities for students in the Northern Marianas Islands to become civically engaged and to gain meaningful, practical experience in government service. In proposing the establishment of a federally administered fellowship program for this purpose, Congressman Sablon honors most fittingly a longtime educator who made an indelible mark in the CNMI. She is the late Dr. Rita Hokog Inos, who battled cancer and passed away a year ago last month. She is a shining example of what it means to give back to community and to pursue a career in government service. Acquiring direct insight into the functioning of government, whether at the local or federal level, not only positions one well for a career in government, but also equips one with knowledge for success in the private sector. Most notably, many young adults fortunate enough to secure a government-sponsored fellowship are spurred to a lifetime commitment of active, engaged citizenship in their community. This bill is timely, as the relatively small but growing federal presence in the Northern Marianas Islands presents another opportunity for partnership between the federal government within the community. Additionally, a fellowship program for CNMI students would help bridge the distance and financial challenges they inevitably and unavoidably face through no choosing of their own in exploring careers of interest to them and in augmenting their classroom learning. While technology has helped connect classrooms, and in our case today, a witness to this hearing room there simply is no substitute for direct on-the-job learning and personal mentorship that a fellowship entails. Therefore, we welcome perspectives today on this most notorious proposal and also ideas about how best to broaden the availability of such opportunities to students, not only residing in CNMI, but in each of the territories and in the freely associated states as well. In doing so, we join Congressman Sablon in honoring the legacy of Dr. Enos and embrace the commitment of all educators who, like Dr. Enos, commit themselves to inspiring young people to pursue government service and become engaged citizens in their communities. The second bill of focus today is H.R. 6015, a bill I introduced for a two-fold purpose. First, H.R. 6015 would formalize and make permanent the work of the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the Department of Commerce in publishing gross domestic product statistics for the territories. Second, H.R. 6015 would make technical corrections to the, <coughs> to the immigration provisions of Public Law 110-229 affecting my district, the territory of Guam, that would conform the law to congressional intent. The first set of GDP estimates released earlier this year 
by the BEA for American Samoa, CNMI, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands is the result of an initiative of the Office of Insular Affairs at the Department of Interior. As a result, the four territorial governments were afforded access to expertise and federal support to help capture and determine GDP data. Such statistics improve economic planning, forecasting, and decision making on the part of both the public and the private sectors. The BEA presently computes GDP data for each of the 50 states in the District of Columbia as part of its permanent program, while OIA and BEA have extended their interagency agreement for a second round of GDP estimates for the territories. It is important that this work be institutionalized and that it continue for the foreseeable future. Enactment of H.R. 6015 would accomplish this objective as well as extend the GDP work to encompass Puerto Rico and the freely associated states. Last, before the subcommittee today is the matter of country participation in the Guam CNMI visa waiver program and federal policy affecting that program that is inconsistent with congressional intent and program authorization. In devising the initial list of eligible countries for the program, the Department of Homeland Security determined two countries to have had significant economic benefit. Congress extended for such countries to be made eligible for the program. Yet the Department published a regulation which precludes any such possibility and in that same regulation committed to reevaluate such country participation after implementation of additional layered security measures. In the interim, the Department is paroling into the C CNMI and only the CNMI nationals of the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation, both countries of significant economic benefit. H.R. 6015 would require the Department to provide for an alternative procedure for such benefits to be realized in the entire visa waiver program area should the pro Department maintain these countries as ineligible for participation in the program. Tourism continues to be a large driver of the economy of both Guam and the CNMI, and these new markets must be included to ensure the viability of the visitor industry in our region. As this matter remains before the President's Interagency Group on Insular Areas and inevitably involves input of the Department of the Interior, we welcome today an update on the overall federal effect to strengthen both security and country participation under the Guam CNMI Visa Waiver Program. In closing, I appreciate the support we have received from my friend and our ranking Republican member, uh, Mr. Cassidy, in addressing, or Mr. Brown, in addressing insular issues, and most especially his support with regard to the Guam CNMI Visa Waiver Program. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues on this subcommittee on both sides of the aisle to improve federal policy affecting the insular areas, and in the case of the two bills before us today, to engender a more responsive and assistive federal government for fulfilling these important needs. And now, I recognize for an opening statement that he may have the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Cassidy, who is assuming the role today of ranking Republican member for Mr. Brown. Mr. Cassidy, you are now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today's legislative hearing reviews two bills, H.R. 4339, introduced by my colleague, Mr. Sablon, and H.R. 6015, introduced by you, Madam Chair. H.R. 4339 creates a fellowship program for qualified Northern Mariana Island students. The fellowship, um, those in the fellowship would participate in local or state government for a semester or a summer. The program managed by the Secretary of Interior. And the federal government would pay for this new fellowship program through an annual appropriation. In the first year, $1 million would be authorized and sub such sums as may be necessary in future years. I look forward to hearing the witnesses' views on this bill and to understand the need for this program and why this should be a federal priority in the time of a $14 trillion deficit. The other bill, H.R. 6015, addresses two issues. First, it requires the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the Department of Commerce to publish certain economic data for territories. 
The Department of Interior contracted with the Bureau of Economic Analysis over the last two fiscal years to get GDP data for the territories in order to better analyze the economic progress of each territory. Prior to the contract, Interior did not have this data. I am interested to hear if the administration supports these provisions. Secondly, the bill would make two clarifications to the Consolidated Natural Resources Act of 2008. This act required the application of federal immigration laws to the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands and included a transition period to minimize adverse impacts to the Commonwealth's economy. The intent of the transition period was to slowly phase out the non-resident guest worker program established by the Commonwealth and exempt both Guam and the Commonwealth during the five-year transition period from statutory limitations on non-immigrant work visas. The Department of Homeland Security interprets this law to allow for a five-year extension of the Commonwealth's non-resident guest worker program, but does not interpret the law to allow for an, ex for an extension of the exemption for the numerical limitations on worker visas. H.R. 6015 would clarify that the work visa exemption should be extended for five years if the Secretary also extends the Commonwealth's non-resident guest worker program. Lastly, H.R. 6015 authorizes the Secretary of Homeland Security to use an alternative procedure to allow tourists from China and Russia into the Commonwealth and Guam. The Consolidated Natural Resources Act created the Guam and Northern Mariana Islands Visa Waiver Program, and the intent of the program was to allow tourists from approved countries to enter the Commonwealth or Guam for periods up to 45 days. The Secretary of Homeland Security issued an interim rule for the program and did not include Russia and China, even though these countries have provided significant economic benefits to the region. To date, the Secretary has not issued a final rule, but in October 2009, she exercised her parole authority to allow tourists from China and Russia into the Commonwealth on a case-by-case -case basis. This has created a disparity in the visa waiver program since the parole authority is not available in Guam. The visa waiver program was created to treat Guam and the Commonwealth equally. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses regarding their views on the proposed legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank my colleague, gentleman from Louisiana, for his opening statement. And I now turn to our colleague from the Northern Marianas. But before doing so, I take this opportunity to inform the subcommittee and those in attendance of the procedures that have been arranged for facilitating the testimony today from one of our witnesses who joins us from Saipan in the CNMI. At Congressman Sablon's request, the hearing room has been equipped with video teleconferencing technology today to enable Mr. Anthony Pellegrino to testify from Congressman Sablon's district office in Saipan. At this appropriate point, we will turn to Mr. Pellegrino for his testimony, and we appreciate the support we have received from the staff of the committee and Congressman Sablon's office to make this possible. This arrangement enables us to receive input, which will aid the subcommittee in evaluating the bill before us which concerns the CNMI, the distant congressional district from the nation's capital coming in from the distant congressional district. Congressman Sablon, you are now recognized for any brief introductory remarks you may wish to make. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, um, uh, Mr. Cassidy, for joining us this morning. I'd also like to welcome Mr. Pellegrino at some midnight there, and uh, 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 thank you for taking the opportunity to join us. Um, Mr. Williams is here representing our governor. Mr. Secretary, it's always nice to see you, um, and uh, Mr. Bickley, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss um, HR 4339, the Rita, Dr. Rita Hokukinu's Fellowship Act. And, and at the outset, I'd like to say that, yeah, I welcome, I welcome including the um, territory of Guam, America, and Samoa, the Virgin Islands in the legislation. Uh, we passed it around earlier, and uh, there was no comment, so we obviously kept it to the cinema, but welcome. I, I'd like to include the other territories in this also. And for those who have had an opportunity to know Dr. Hokuk and to know and work with Dr. Hoc, uh, Dr. Enos, it was clear that she had her heart in, in, in education, but in, in some other thing also. And um, she worked to raise the standard of education in the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, both in the curriculum and in terms of, of uh, standards for teachers. And um, she's, um, 
the present leadership at the school has continues to um, to uh, work on the progress that they have achieved over all these years. But Dr. Hook, um, Dr. Enos also has something else in, in this, is that, and, and this is what exactly, and what I'd like to bring out today, is the absence of governance in our community. Um, the, 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 the professionalism and the capacity of people who run our government, uh, whether it's a manager in a program, or it's a public affairs officer, or a legislator, or you know, elected officials. And, and this is what I'd like to address, because the relationship between the Northern Mariana Islands and the federal government is, is, is a very new relationship, basically, and, uh, and um, 30 years, and we need to continue to improve that relationship so we could avoid all the misunderstandings that we face uh, unnecessarily over time. But, um, Dr. Enos, in, in just in terms of education, not, she is also not just w concerned about the three R's, um, the formal education, she's also very concerned about the training for individuals um, in the vocational trades. And it's very important that Mr. Pellegrino joins us because he is actually fulfilling a void that the, the public school systems were have not been able to, to do because of the lack of funds. and. He's um, providing training for people to learn um, not just in financial literacy, but it also in, uh, in carpentry, mason, um, how to flip a burger, culinary chefs, and, and all those things. I was with him uh, two weeks ago, and I watched him, uh, his institute, the Northern Maryland Islands Trade Institute, promote uh, some 100 uh, individuals into their next level of training. But again, I want to make it very clear that a po an important part of the legacy of Dr. Enos was to improve the entire community, um, and, and we can do that through education. I agree with that, and I support that in the vocational traits, and that's half of the, uh, the, the, the her, her legacy. The other half is the need for uh, governance, uh, good governance in our community, and, and, um, and we still have a long way to do that. Uh, again, um, I, Madam Chair, um, I would like to comment on, on 6015 at the right opportunity, or if you want me to do it right now, I can. But thank you very much. Um. I'd like to ask my colleague to make his comments now on 16. All right, okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, at, the, at the outset, uh, I support your um, effort to, on the BEA, and I'm grateful that you're on your leadership on this one, and including um, extending it to our friends um, and the uh, freely associated states and their territories. The data is certainly lacking in, in, in for the territories and includes the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, I also uh, would like to say two things. Um, first, um, I, I support the provision that will clarify the age visa cap exemption and 110-229. Uh, we'll continue as long as the transition period is extended by the Secretary of Labor. Um, I'm, however, I'm concerned that this provision will exclude other transition um, programs uh, from being in included in such extensions. Uh, uh, which, given the unresolved implementation issues, may cause additional problems for the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, the, with respect to the Guam CNMI visa waiver program, I support the intent to ensure access to countries that provide so significant economic um, benefit to the CNMI, which may not be included in the list of participating countries in the final rule. Um, our good colleague, um, Eni Fanman Vega, is not here, but uh, Kazakhstan is something that, that immediately rises to, uh, my, for, comes to my mind. Um, and because you mentioned twice that sometimes legislation is passed, becomes law, and the departments implement it in a separate way, and which is why we're here today. I am concerned, however, that the provision in, in the legislation, in the, the bill as written, may be interpreted in a manner that may be detrimental to the Northern Marian Islands. Specifically, that it is an all or nothing requirement and will limit the DH, the Secretary of Homeland Security's discretionary authority to make any exceptions based on particular needs or circumstances. We have the Chinese and the Russian tourists right now, um, paroled to the CNMI on a case by case basis. If it's an all or nothing, while she would like to use her discretion and to the Northern Mariana Islands, and for whatever reason she has right now, she's not using that discretion to, to Guam. Uh, I, I don't want to force her to say, well, since one area can't have it, the other can. So 
uh, and I'm, I'm obligated, I must do to ensure that the Northern Mariana Islands does not lose access to the China and Russian tourists. It represents uh, some 11% of our visitors' arrival and 20% of tourism revenue. Um, I'd like to have an assurance from the S Department of Homeland Security, Madam Chair, and uh, we can work on this, we can work the language that, um, that this all or nothing uh, uh, provision, um, uh, thing will not happen should this bill be enacted. Uh, and at the present time, that is why I am not able to support the provision as written. And, uh, but again, I thank you for your leadership, and I thank you for the opportunity um, this morning um, to hear 43, um, 4339, and obviously, of course, uh, 1615. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. I wish to thank my colleague from the Northern Marianas, Mr. Sablon, for his efforts and his remarks and his support of the two bills. And of course, we will take his concerns under consideration. I now welcome and introduce our witnesses who today comprise a single panel. Before us are the Honorable Anthony M. Babauta, the Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Insular Areas, who will testify on behalf of the administration on both bills. Mr. Howard P. Willens, Consul to Governor Benigno Fittiel of the CNMI, who is here on Governor Fittiel's behalf to present his testimony. Mr. Jim Begley, Vice Chairman of the Guam Visitors Bureau, who will testify about H.R. 6015. And via the video conferencing arrangement, Mr. Anthony Pellegrino in Saipan, who is the current president of the Marianas Trades Institute a former president of the Saipan Chamber of Commerce, who will testify about H.R. 4339 today as a former member of the CNMI Board of Education, whose term coincided with Dr. Eno's tenure as commissioner of the CNMI public school system. I would note that it is after midnight in the CNMI. Buenas and half a day, Mr. Pellegrino. Before turning to our first witness at this point, I would also note that the subcommittee clerk has received written statements for the record from the following people. The Honorable Felix P. Camacho, Governor of Guam, in support of H.R. 6015, and from the Honorable Paul A. Maglonia, President of the Senate of the 17th Northern, Northern Marianas Commonwealth Legislature, in support of H.R. 4339. Both Governor Camacho and Senate President Manglonia sent their regrets as they were unable to join us today, and as such, I ask unanimous consent that their statements be made part of the record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Now we will move to witness testimony as we begin. I would note for our witnesses that the red timing light on the table is malfunctioning today. <laughs> we'll, but that uh, timing light indicates when five minutes have passed and your time has concluded. However, I've been told by Dominic, who is down on the, uh, taking uh, notes down at the table right next to you, uh, that he will turn his timing box. And uh, when you see that red light, you know your time is uh, concluded. We would appreciate your cooperation in adhering to these time limits as best as possible today because I do know that my colleagues here have a number of questions of our witnesses. Please be assured that your full written statement will be submitted for our hearing record. And now, without further ado, I'd like to recognize Assistant Secretary Babauta. You may begin. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss H.R. 4339 and H.R. 6015. H.R. 4339, the Dr. Rita Hokuk Enos Fellowship Act, would authorize the Secretary of the Interior to fund fellowships for U.S. citizen college students domiciled in the CNMI to spend a semester or summer in a local CNMI government office or a federal government office. The Department of the Interior supports opportunities for young persons from the United States territories and the freely associated states to learn about their local and national government. For many years, the Office of Insular Affairs has provided funding for the close-up program to bring high school students from the islands to visit Washington, D.C., New York, Philadelphia, and Williamsburg. OIA close-up funding for fiscal year 2011 is expected to be $1 million for approximately 145 students 
plus two dozen teachers from U.S. territories and the FAS. Also, the Office of Insular Affairs expects to provide $276,000 in fiscal year 2011 to support the participation of four students from each insular area in the six-week Junior State of America summer program. Additionally, the Federal Government has a number of intern and student programs that provide opportunities uh, for persons to gain experience with both the Congress and with the Executive Branch. The Department of the Interior, however, opposes the enactment of H.R. 4339. First, it is duplicative of numerous programs that provide students with exposure to the Federal Government. Second, the bill would limit the participation to students domiciled in the CNMI and students from other territories in the freely associated states would not be included. Third, while this would be a federal program under the auspices of the Interior Secretary, there would be a local component in the CNMI which would be better funded and administered by the CNMI itself. Fourth, legislated content requirements of the program would likely burden local and federal agencies with additional tasks and costs, as would the bill's reporting requirements. And lastly, severe budget constraints prevent the funding of such a program for any time into the foreseeable future. The Department of the Interior encourages students with an interest in gaining experience with government to participate in, in existing travel, intern, and student programs. The experience will be well worth their while. Regarding H.R. 6015, Section 1 of the bill would institutionalize the collection of gross domestic product data for both the United States territories and the freely associated states. At present, the territories and the FAS are not included in the, na in the nation's macroeconomic accounting. Realizing this deficiency, the Office of Insular Affairs made available $1.6 million in technical assistance for the Bureau of Economic Analysis to compile island economic data for American Samoa, Guam, the CNMI, and the Virgin Islands. The results of this baseline effort were announced on May 5th, and for 2007, the GDP for American Samoa was $532 million. Guam's GDP was $4.28 billion, the CNMI $962 million, and the Virgin Islands was $4.58 billion. OIA's technical assistance was always meant as seed money for including territorial GDP data in the United States national income accounts. It was not meant to be permanent. Madam Chair, your legislation to institutionalize territorial GDP data collection and reporting within the BEA is appropriate and timely provided that resources other than OIA's technical assistance funds are available to BEA for BEA to undertake this expanded assignment for all eight jurisdictions. The Department of the Interior strongly supports the enactment of Section 1 of the H.R. 6015. Section 2A of the legislation is intended to clarify that if the transitional worker program for the CNMI is extended, the lifting of the numerical limitation on H visa workers for Guam and the CNMI would also continue for the period of the extension. The Administration agrees that Public Law 110-229 should be clarified to provide authority to extend the HCAP extensions beyond December 31, 2014. However, we would suggest that this determination be made with respect to the CNMI, Guam, or both based upon the labor needs of each territory for an HCAP extension rather than being tied to the CNMI Transitional Worker Program. We would be pleased to work with the Congress and the Committee on specific language to accomplish this. Section 2B of the legislation would require the Secretary of Homeland Security to provide a mechanism to permit visa-free travel of nationals of countries that have provided a significant economic benefit to the CNMI from visitors for pleasure in the one-year period preceding the date of enactment of Public Law 110-229. DHS has determined that visitors from Russia and China at this time may not be formally included in the Guam CNMI visa waiver program. However, in order to maintain the CNMI's tourism industry and help its economy, the Secretary of DHS has allowed visiting nationals of Russia and China to be paroled into the CNMI on an individual and case-by-case -case basis. This parole policy has not been extended to Guam, although we understand that DHS is examining the possibility of using its discretionary parole authority for visitors to Guam. I wish to emphasize that should DHS include Guam under its parole authority or expand the visa waiver program, that the Secretary of DHS may either revoke a country's eligibility or end the program altogether if the Secretary finds abuse such as overstays, security threats, false documents, or asylum. The Department of the Interior defers to DHS on this specific provision, but I'd like to reiterate 
that the Secretary of DHS has discretionary authority to extend a similar program to Guam. This is consistent with the legislative intent of the Congress in enacting the Guam CNMI Visa Waiver Program. At the remainder, of my, at the conclusion of my testimony, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Babauta, for your testimony. Mr. Willens, you are now recognized for five minutes. And Congressman uh, Sublime. Would you move closer to the microphone, yeah. please? Uh, I appreciate your courtesy in extending uh, the opportunity for me to appear here today on, on behalf of Governor uh, Fidial. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, H.R. 6 6015 and Section 1 in particular, in light of what the Chairwoman has said, uh, uh, I would like to say that we fully support uh, a, a Section 1 of, of 6015 to make permanent uh, uh, funding for uh, the uh, uh, BEA uh, GDP analyses. It seems to us that the uh, section does raise the broader issue of the uh, fact that the insular areas for years have complained about the fact that the federal agencies do not provide the same kind of, of uh, economic data that is routinely supplied to states, uh, uh, counties, and even smaller political entities on the mainland. Uh, and repeatedly, the insular areas have uh, pled uh, with the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the Bureau of the Census, uh, as examples of the federal agencies involved to uh, extend their activities to provide this data uh, to the insular areas. Without such data, the governors and elected officials of the insular areas are severely handicapped in managing their economies, and the members of Congress are handicapped in not having current economic data available on the basis of which sound public policy uh, for the territories uh, can be shaped uh, and ad administered. So, for example, uh, in response to this need, uh, at the time the ARRA was being considered in early 2009, a section 8104 uh, was inserted into that bill and at the last moment was changed uh, to provide that the insular areas would be included in what's called the County uh, 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 Business Patterns Program of the Bureau of the Census. Uh, and furthermore, census was directed uh, to provide annual reports with respect to the way of developing more sufficient data for the insular areas uh, and to do so. Uh, I can report uh, uh, in all seriousness that uh, uh, the County uh, Patterns uh, 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 Program is quite inapplicable to the insular areas. It involves limitations on data collection that would render it virtually useless, and reports under that program are not produced until 18 months after the year in question in any event. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, census, so far as we know, has not produced the annual reports with respect to addressing the needs of the insular areas for more comprehensive and timely uh, data. It's an issue I believe this subcommittee should take up, and that as a matter of ongoing concern, mount a broader program in consultation with the appropriate fellow committees uh, uh, to push uh, for the funding and the direction to federal agencies that then, as Congressman Sablon suggests, could be followed up and implemented. With respect to uh, Section uh, 2A of the bill, I, I beg to differ with some of the statements that have been made here today. Uh, in the first place, it's the Commonwealth's view uh, that no amendment of the statute is required uh, uh, to clarify the authority of the Secretary of the Labor to extend the transition period and, and thereby by necessity all three components of the transition program. We have supplied a legal opinion to the uh, uh, Department of Health Land uh, Homeland Security and, and I have urged in person the opportunity to argue the issue uh, before DHS lawyers, before some impartial senior lawyer or policymaker and my humble pleas have gone uh, uh, unanswered. Uh, the point is we understand that DHS disagrees with our legal position and GAO has supported uh, 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 Homeland Security in that regard. However, I'm pleased to remind this committee uh, that the Senate committee in its, in its report accompanying 110-229 agreed with the Commonwealth's view of the statute and said that any extension uh, by the Secretary would amount to an extension of all three components of the transition program, including the very important Commonwealth-only investor visa program. That is critical to our tourism business, and we urge this sub subcommittee uh, uh, to broaden the language of subsection 2A so as to cover this particular component, and we have su suggested language in the governor's statement to accomplish that 
a, a goal. And lastly, uh, with respect to uh, Section uh, 2B, the Guam Visa Waiver Program, uh, the governor strongly supports uh, the issuance by DHS of final regulations with respect to this matter. In the Commonwealth's view, the parole option, although certainly welcome in view of the alternative of doing nothing, uh, does not suffice for a final version of the regulations. We recognize uh, that, as the Assistant Secretary properly points out, that each is discretionary to a considerable extent. But we who work and live in Washington know that perceptions are sometimes more important than reality, and the perceptions here are that a parole program is a stopgap program that it, at best seeks to preserve the status quo. We want something more than that because we're asking airlines to make substantial investments of millions of dollars to provide regular scheduled service to the Commonwealth. Without that kind of service, we cannot grow the tourist business. So we ask you to consider uh, this issue, uh, and we do support Guam uh, uh, in its uh, desire to, at the very least, at least have a parole uh, 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 program instituted uh, there. We see no inconsistency here between the positions of the Commonwealth and the positions of Guam with respect to the need uh, for access to the Chinese and Russian uh, visitors. Uh, with, I will uh, only remind the, the committee that in our, our statement we do uh, address some of our familiar concerns about implementation by DHS of, of, of the program. When the governor was here four months ago, he addressed some of those issues. And there is a new issue developing with respect to the enforcement by DHS uh, uh, in addressing uh, illegal aliens in the Commonwealth. And we think that that's a subject that deserves further discussion in this committee. I thank the subcommittee for allowing me to uh, present these views. I thank you, uh, Mr. Willens, for your testimony. And I'd also like to thank uh, Governor Fidio for uh, having you here as his witness during this uh, hearing. And if you would, please extend uh, my thank yous and my good wishes to Governor Fidio. Thank you, Madam. Uh, before we get to our next uh, witness at the witness stand, I would like to recognize the uh, presence of two very important people from the territory of Guam. Uh, Mayor Melissa Savaris of Dededo, Guam, and Vice Mayor Robert Hoffman of Sinahanya. Would you please stand? Thank you for being here. Mayor Savaris serves as the president of the Mayor's Council of Guam and is mayor of the most populated municipality on Guam, the village of Dededo. And Vice Mayor Hoffman serves as vice president of the Mayor's Council. And like uh, uh, Mr. Begley, uh, Mr. Hoffman is a member of the board of directors of the Guam Visitors Bureau. Both Mayor Savaris and Vice Mayor Hoffman are here to demonstrate their support for H.R. 6015, and I appreciate their being present today. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, when you travel as many as thousands of miles from the territories of Guam and CNMI, you have to recognize these important people. So thank you very much, mayors, for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Begley, you are our final witness this morning. Oh, second to the final. I'm sorry. We, we have one other from uh, Saipan. Uh, you are recognized now for, to present your testimony before the committee. Thank you, Chairwoman Berdalio, uh, Congressman Cassidy, Congressman Sablon, and other distinguished members of the committee. It's a pleasure to appear before you today on behalf of the Guam Visitors Bureau and provide testimony on the implementation of the CNRA and H.R. 6015. As you know, I had the honor of testifying before you earlier this year. At that time, I urged you to enact legislation that would clarify and correct some of the technical errors in the CNRA. On behalf of the Guam Visitors Bureau, I am pleased that many members of this committee have listened to the tourism community and introduced legislation which would provide technical changes to the visa waiver title of the CNRA, among other things. Thank you, Chairwoman Berdalio, Ranking Member Brown, and many others in the House of co-sponsoring this important legislation. Madam Chairwoman, Guam is fortunate to have you as our representative in Congress. This legislation is yet another sign that you are able to tackle tough issues in a bipartisan manner, while at the same time gaining broad support among your colleagues and nearly all the other delegates. Madam Chairwoman, we believe that the bill you introduced is vital to the future of the success of the Marianas tourism economy. 
The current bifurcated system in place for Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands should be equalized throughout the Marianas region as Congress intended. Indeed, when Congress combined the Guam Visa Waiver Program with the CNMI in 2008 as part of the CNRA, it was clear that Congress intended a unified application of the law in the region. While some may say that Washington is 15 square miles surrounded by logic and reason, I think Congress got it right by combining these programs. After all, why should DHS be responsible for administering two separate programs on islands that are only 90 miles apart and both are part of the United States? Unfortunately, the current system is not that different than before the enactment of this law. One system for the Marianas and another for Guam. We're grateful that federal law now prevails in the region, but the current bifurcated system is cumbersome and confusing, not only for those working in the industry, but for the tourists as well. As a result, over this past year, the CNMI has been unable to expand its tourism market as was expected and intended by Congress. This is a very key fact. Although the countries of China and Russia were deemed by DHS as being of significant economic benefit, the uncertainty surrounding the parole program and its confusing nature for tourists and tourism professionals deters investment and marketing potential. To illustrate this point, in, in Continental Airlines' written testimony on May 18th of this year, Charles Duncan, the president of Continental Micronesia, testified that, quote, uncertainties surrounding the Guam CNMI visa waiver program, Continental has not added nonstop service from China or Russia to Guam or Saipan. The confusing and cumbersome nature of this program was made clear to me a few months ago when I was flying from Tokyo to Saipan. On the flight, the attendants passed out the customs and landing forms. After the announcement was made, at least 50 buzzers went off asking questions about which forms to fill out, whether these people were to apply under the Guam CNMI program, or whether they were to apply for the other program. While we are grateful to Secretary Napolitano and her colleagues at DHS for extending parole authority to the CNMI in November of last year, we need a regional solution, full visa waiver implementation, in order to fully harness the economic opportunity that these source markets present to both Guam and the CNMI. Last year, when I appeared before this committee, I testified on how Guam's visa waiver program is worse now than it was prior to the enactment of the CNRA. The new Guam CNMI program is now more rigorous than the mainland visa waiver program and a monumental departure from settled law in place for over 24 years. In 1986, when Congress first created the Guam Visa Waiver Program, Congress, Congress emphasized the unique conditions prevailing on Guam and its isolated location, which justify a broad application of the visa waiver system. The interim final rule has turned that broad application on its head. During the hearing last year, we had an opportunity to hear from DHS on this issue. At that time, it was made clear to members of this committee that DHS took this restrictive approach in the interim final rule because they wanted to work on enhanced security measures, such as extending the ESTA program in the Mar to the Marianas region. I recall the DHS also testified at that time that there was a concern with onward leakage of passengers from Guam to the mainland in Hawaii. With only one seven-hour flight per day from Guam to Hawaii and a full complement of federal CBP officials on Guam since the beginning, we disputed this fact and still have seen no data to support their assertion. It was noted earlier this year by the GAO that high non-immigrant visa refusal, refusal rates were a factor in DHS's exclusion of China and Russia in the joint program. In the context of the previous Guam program, which was the basis for the new program, we know this to be completely incorrect. Nearly a, ne nearly a year later, these issues are still unaddressed and Congress must act. The interim final rule has not expanded tourism, will not expand tourism, and must be corrected. We believe Congress must expeditiously pass H.R. 6015. Madam Chairwoman, as you know, your constituents rely heavily on the tourism economy for jobs to support their families. Our industry has been the backbones of Guam's economy since the island was first settled, and it is now on the decline. With your help, as well as the other co-sponsor of, of this legislation, Congress has the ability to finish what we started under the CNRA. You have the authority to enable an economic transformation in the Marianas region with no cost to the taxpayer. You have the authority to demand that the federal agencies tasked with administering the laws you enact do so consistent with your intent. I believe that Guam and the CNMI working together to market these islands as a destination will bring millions in investment, create hundreds of new jobs, and many other opportunities for struggling local economies. 
we can accomplish this with your help by enacting h r sixty fifteen thank you again for the honor of appearing before you today and i welcome any questions that you may have thank you very much mr begley who is representing today the guam visitors bureau and thank you for your strong support of h r sixty fifteen and now buenas and half a day mr pellegrino all the way from saipan and ladies and gentlemen it's about one a m in the morning so we thank you for your dedication and uh, being able to stay awake at this uh, early hour. Uh, you can now begin with your testimony, Mr. Pellegrino. Good morning, Madam uh, uh, Chairwoman Bordalio and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on H.R. 4339, the Dr. Rita Hocock Innis Fellowship Act. I support the legislation and have submitted a longer written statement of support. Thank you also for giving me the opportunity to testify here without leaving home. As you know, I am seated in the office of our delegate to Congress on Saipan over 8,000 miles from Washington. It is past my normal bedtime, and yes, I'm slowly falling asleep, but it is much easier for me physically and financially to be able to testify by video conference rather than flying halfway around the world for a few minutes of your time. I really appreciate that. I want to commend Delegate Sablon for asking the subcommittee to experiment with the use of this technology. And I want to thank Chairwoman Bordalio for agreeing to try this innovation. It is actually very appropriate that we explore new ways to bridge the geographical gap between the Northern Marianas and Washington while considering H.R. 4339. Because this bill also aims to draw the Northern Mariners and the United States closer together, of course our ties are increasing, particularly as the Mariners play a greater role in the security and defense of our nation. But I think it is most important that our people, especially our young people, also become better connected with the political philosophy of the United States. The youth of our islands and future leaders need the opportunity to experience firsthand the workings of government they need to better understand the similarities and differences between our federal and our local commonwealth government. This connection, this experience, this understanding will lead to an improved relationship between Washington and the island with fewer disagreements and more of the successes that can come from cooperation. In closing, I would like to say some, that naming the fellowship said H.R. 4339 creates after Dr. Rita Hocock Guinness is not simply a way to honor a person who was much respected and beloved. Dr. Guinness began teaching on the island of Rhoda with just a high school diploma, but over the years steadily progressed until she had earned a doctorate in education. She eventually served as Commissioner of Education for our public school system for six years. During that time, I had the honor of working with her on the Board of Education. Accomplishments as commissioner was establishment of an economic database system that enabled our schools to comply with federal standards. And as commissioner, she was dedicated to reaching out to other islands in the Pacific to share resources and knowledge. In all, Dr. Edis's life was a model for the goals of these fellowships. She was an educator who understood that the more we learn, the better our lives can be. She, thought, she devoted herself to public service because she understood that all of us have better lives when our communities thrive. And Dr. Enos believed in the importance of blending stateside and island ways because both cultures have something to offer the other. To me, these three attributes, education, public service, cultural integration, are all embodied in the fellowships that H.R. 4339 would establish. I am sure Dr. Enos would approve and I urge you to adopt H.R. 4339. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. See, Juice Masse, Mr. Pellegrino, for staying with us at this very early hour in the morning, and we do invite you to uh, remain with us. Uh, we may have some questions for you, if you don't mind. I will now recognize members for any questions that they may wish to ask, alternating between the majority and the minority and allowing five minutes for each member. I'm going to um, uh, delay with my questioning. I'm going to ask the ranking member if he has any questions at this time, 
And if he does, and then we'll go as a courtesy to Mr. Sablon. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, um, Mr. Babato, Babata, Babata. I'm sorry, Babata. Yes, sir. Babata. I'm sorry. Um, first, uh, first, Mr. Pellegrino, to the staff. Let me congratulate you on the video conferencing. I've often been struck that I Skype with my daughters at night to do their homework, but we don't Skype in this committee. My daughter, who is eight years old, is more technologically advanced sometimes in the halls of Congress. And it benefits not only you there, but it would also benefit global warming, state and county budgets, you name it, if we did more of this. So just thank you for doing it. I congratulate you, and I hope we do it not just for you, but also for Livingston and Ascension Parish that I represent and every other parish I represent. So first, let me say that. Uh, and my eight-year-old says thank you, too. <laughs> that said, uh, Mr. Babalto, I totally agree with your uh, kind of position or the uh, administration's position on Mr. Sablon's bill, which although I think is a great bill, uh, a wonderful bill, on the other hand, uh, we just don't have the money. And a million dollars is chump change in Washington, D.C., but sooner or later chump change adds up and it becomes real stuff. And so, uh, first, I like the bill, but I, I will just tell you that we just ain't got the money. Uh, and I think that's the administration's position. So in the spirit of bipartisanship, I totally agree with President Obama. Um, secondly, uh, <laughs> fiscal responsibility. We're, gl we're glad he's moving to the right. <laughs> but secondly, let me move on to um, Department of Interior and your relationship with Department of Homeland Security on the visa bills. Now, it's my understanding DOI has, if you will, the moral and the statutory authority to ensure the prosperity of the territories. And we all want everybody to be prosperous. This committee is particularly charged with the territories. I am struck the wisdom of these folks saying that the absence of certainty regarding uh, tourist visas from Russia and from China is going to chill the investment of an airline and the facilities required to increase the amount of carriage they bring. Now, it seems like whatever Homeland Security's issues are, which I wish they would be more forthcoming from, I'm told that they declined the invitation to testify, you would weigh in on the opposite side because, frankly, this is the prosperity of these territories at stake. Now, but you kind of, if I may point out in your testimony, equivocated on that. Um, so can you give us a statement, perhaps more forthcoming, do you think the certainty that Mr. Bagley, I'm sorry, ba ba Mr. Bagley said we need certainty so these carriers will begin to carry? Do you agree with that? Or do you say, oh, no, this parole program, we're on a case-by-case -case basis, and it enters the bowels of DHS and finally comes out, and maybe you get it, maybe you don't, maybe dissuade, may dissuading uh, airline companies from expanding capacity? Mm. Well, thank you for the question. I mean, I, I, I have a hard time disagreeing with Mr. Bagley that there is certainty that's needed on the part of businesses that are operating uh, in both Guam and the Northern Marianas in order to be able to forecast and make proper investments uh, to improve and diversify the economy. I believe, however, that um, uh, the administration, the Department of Homeland Security, and, and our work with them and our interaction with them, uh, both at just the normal uh, interagency level and then also at the level of the interagency group on insular areas, that we're moving in the right direction uh, to try to provide uh, the opportunity and meet the intent of, of Congress with respect to uh, uh, the legislation, uh, Public Law 110. Now, I'll tell you, I'm a little bit confused. Mr. Begley, didn't you tell me, or, or one of the two gentlemen said that the Senate actually has said, no, wait a second, DHS, you're not doing it the way we wanted to. And yet, sir, you're saying that indeed Homeland Security is trying to comply. I got a sense from one of your testimonies that, no, you're not trying to comply. You're trying to make it harder than it historically has been, and indeed harder than it is to get into the mainland. Uh, do you differ with what the characterization you just gave, that Homeland Security is actually trying to comply with the intent? I got the impression from one of you two that, no, they're trying to non-comply. Um, thank you for, for the question. Um, in, in the experience that's happened since, the, in, in our experience, since the CNRA was passed, um, when the interim final rule was published, in fact, um, it, it took Guam backwards 
um, the intent was to move the economies forward. And in fact, the interim final rule that was published took Guam backwards um, and actually in, in provisions that were inserted into the interim final rule that were never ever inserted or used in visa waiver policy for the mainland United States that were for some reason inserted in the interim final rule for the Guam CNMI program actually made the program more onerous than the mainland visa waiver Can you program. establish a relationship between taking that backwards and the chilling of economic investment in the tourism industry? Um, the Yes, definitely. The the there's there's two reasons for for that. One, um, I'm this, almost out of time, so I'm gonna just take your yes. This, this law was intended to expand tourism yeah. in in the islands. The CNMI, uh, whose economy is on on the brink of collapse, basically today, even with the extension of parole authority, has not been able to expand their tourism. And the reason they will not is because an airline won't put thirty to fifty million dollars at risk in pulling a plane onto that route with the, with the nature of parole authority being discretionary, with parole authority being, even though visa waiver is discretionary, parole authority is perceived in the industry as something that is not fully understood. And therefore, there's great reluctance along the airlines, the tour operators, and all the components of the tourism industry that while they want to invest, they won't as long as parole That makes total is. sense to me. So DIY, it must make total sense to you. I mean, Homeland Security is basically, you know, oh my gosh, if we get, if something bad happens, we get blamed, so let's just shut it down and the heck with the economy of the Northern Mariana Islands. That's kind of my perception of it. Now, it seems like DOI is the advocate, if you will, of the territories, would be going to Homeland Security and saying, we have an economy on the brink, you're going against the intent of Congress, we need to be on record saying that is wrong. I think, as you pointed out correctly, uh, with respect to the Department of the Interior advocacy uh, for the islands, we do play a very important role and try to be um, a, a voice uh, to be able to help their economies uh, uh, prosper and develop. I, I think from my testimony this morning and me being able to state that the Department of Homeland Security is currently considering extending a parole authority to Guam uh, is an example. Uh, of the Department of the Interior the interaction with the Department of Homeland Security. I'm telling you, that seems a rather, knowing that you have to be diplomatic, and I'm not blaming you personally, that seems to be a, la a rather casual attitude towards developing the economy of the Northern Mariana Islands and Guam, a casual attitude, one that is irrespective of the economic consequences of the, of the uh, actions of Homeland Security? I can assure you, Congressman, that the interactions that we have with DHS is not casual. Uh, when we talk about being able to develop the economies, um, uh, the CNMI is, uh, is certainly unique, uh, and, and, and it's the, the downfall of its economy uh, has, a unique, has a unique history involved. The extension of the immigration, the U.S. immigration laws to the CNMI uh, also included the extension of parole authority, the use of parole authority, so that we tried not to upset uh, a market that they had been developing for three or four years prior. It makes such sense to me for parole authority, which I typically think of as involving prisoners, will be perceived in a way which is not positive by the airlines. And if we hear, and you haven't disputed, that this is actually a step back from whence we first were, and that there's one flight, and you've got seven agents on the ground to screen that flight, frankly, it seems like Homeland Security is being dilatory in their efforts to provide certainty to major economic investors. And so I'll just close by saying I hope that DOI, um, uh, again, uh, just passionately argues that Homeland Security brings some common sense as well as some compassion to the families who are unemployed because of their dilatory nature in coming to a conclusion. So thank you. I thank yield back. Congressman. I thank the uh, ranking member, uh, Mr. Cassidy, for his questions. I think they were very good questions, and I agree with them. And now, as a courtesy, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, the author of one of our bills for today, and that is uh, Mr. Sablon, for any questions he may have. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, God, I have so many questions, but let me uh, start with the Assistant Secretary. Again, welcome. Um, um, you, I notice you have um, basically five notes on, on 4339 and uh, 
And I'd like to work more closely with you. I'm, I'm, I agree with you, the junior state program and um, with the people and close up and all of those are really exceptional programs and have done wonders uh, uh, to our young people in the Northern Mariana Islands and I'm sure to the other territories. Uh, but um, we need to, in my opinion, we need to, and the legislation proposes to um, include programs for college and graduate students and that's what's lacking, I think, in, in the Mariana San you know very well governance is an issue for the territories and including the Northern Mariana Islands. We need to 